So why is everyone so fat, broke, and busy? First of all, are we fat, broke, and busy as a nation? Let's look at some statistics. 65% or more of America is overweight or obese. 65% or more of Americans are in a bad financial situation. And again, over 60% of Americans are, by their own standards, busier than they want to be. So as I go around the nation talking to people about, you know, throwing out to audiences this notion of fat, broke, and busy, I've yet to have anybody say, you know, how dare you say that? Usually people say, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of us. You know, people aren't usually surprised by the statistics. In the shorter presentation, I'm not going to go deeper into them, but trust me, there's more, right? But really, who would go around the country calling people fat? I mean, what kind of person says such a thing, right? So let me cle be clear on the, where I'm coming from with that angle. It's not the school ground bully version of fat we're talking about. I think part of what we're going to need to address as we understand what's causing this is the change of mentality, change of mindset we need to have around it. Right? It's a growing issue. It's a growing crisis. And I think it's one that although people know about, it hasn't really risen to the point of people taking action yet. And you're going to hear a lot uh, in my presentation throughout the day about what it takes to get to the tipping point where people actually act. People actually do something about it. And so the jovial version of fat, if you will, my apologies if it's offensive. But let's talk about a study, a study that was done. Now, there is a fascinating amount of science and research coming out about the brain and human behavior. Uh, I'm going to just use one as an example. Uh, they called it the magic drink study, where they took three groups. Group one, they called the full Sobe. You've heard of this drink, Sobe, right? $5 bottle, has whatever it has in it. And they took this, uh, you know, it used to be that Psychological experiments were performed on animals, but that was deemed inhumane, so now they're performed on college students. <laughs> so they took uh, these three different groups of college students, and they took group one, and they said, all right, we've come to believe that when you drink Sobe, because of the ingredients in it, uh, it temporarily increases blood flow to the brain, and it makes you smarter. So what we're going to do is give you some Sobe, have you drink it, and then put you through some tests to see how you do. But we're a university, so we're kind of broke, so you need to pay for your Sobe. Right? So they deduct it from their meal plan, the five bucks or whatever it is, give them their SOBE, let it soak in, and then they take their test. Now group two, this is our control group. No SOBE, they didn't tell them about SOBE, they just brought them in and said, we're going to give you these tests and see how you do. Right? So they have a means of comparison. Group three, the cheap SOBE group. Same spiel with the SOBE, they give them the SOBE, tell them it's going to make you smarter and all that, but they say, we got a great deal on SOBE, we got some discount SOBE for you, so your SOBE is only 80 cents. And then they test them and see how they did. Now, who do you think did the best? Group one, two, or three? Let's find out. Turns out that compared to the no SOBE group, the control group, the full SOBE group did slightly better. Now, what does this say about the human brain, where we could take people, give them a drink, and say, this is going to make you smarter, and they're actually smarter? I mean, isn't that amazing? But what was even more amazing to me is the cheap SOBE group did significantly worse. Now, why would that be? They fell into the typical American consumer mindset of, if I got something on the cheap, it's probably not as good. Right? So they're thinking, where did they get my SOBE from? Probably fell off the back of a truck. I probably got E. coli. <laughs> right? <laughs> so really what this shows is a couple of different very important things when it comes to understanding our behavior. One, all of these groups got exactly what they expected to get. So this really shows the power of beliefs, the placebo effect, right? You've seen things like this. But it also shows another interesting driver of humanity, and it puts forth a hypothesis, if you will. And I would submit to you that the human brain is vastly overrated, right? That it is really not the finely tuned, beautiful machine that we sometimes think of it. It is full of flaws and problems and difficulties, and as is evidenced by this and the statistics on how we're doing, this, we're not always making the right choice. And so let's talk about what gets in the way of making those choices and making the choices that we often know would be the right choice to make and then talk about how we can get to making those. Right. First of all, let's talk about where our results come from. Where do our results come from? Behaviors. Behavior produces results. What you do gives you what you get. We could stop right here and we would be comparable to how most people live their lives and we would be as emotionally intelligent as most people. You call up a friend of yours, you say, I'm not happy with my job. What will they tell you? Quit. You can do better than that. Right? You say, I'm not happy with my relationship. What will they tell you? Dump them. I never liked them anyway. Right? <laughs> really what they're going to say is, if you don't like your results, change your behavior. 
because what you do gives you what you get. This right here is why I hate January in my gym. Why do you think that is? <laughs> All the New Year's resolution people, right? Every January, the place is packed full of people with new shoes and new shorts, huffing and wheezing up and down the court. <gasps> By February, they've all either quit or died. <laughs> and we can get back to life as usual. Most people's approach to changing the results in their life comes from behavior modification, which is why most people don't succeed at changing the results in their life. If you really want to make change, we've got to be smarter than to just try a different behavior. Now, you do have to change the behavior, but more importantly than what we do, we've got to get into why we do it. Why do you choose the behaviors you choose? Let's talk about where they come from. There's three main drivers of behavior. The first is called the robot. We'll talk about each of these in greater detail, but the robot is basically unconscious programming, your memory and all those kinds of things. So when you do things without thinking about it, walking, talking, you don't have to consciously think your way. Right? The robot's in charge, if you will. We also have a thing called the emoter. Right? When your emoter's in charge, that's when you are driven by your emotions. And emotions drive different decision making. Urges, desires, wants, fears, drives different kinds of decisions than the robot might do, or than our third driver, which is the thinker. The often underused or misused part of our brains that has reasoning and, and foresight be the basis of our choices. Let's do an example of how these three play together. And then uh, we'll dive a little deeper into each of them. Okay? For example, let's say exercise. Let's say you get home, uh, four, five, six o'clock, whatever, and you're contemplating exercise. What happens is you begin to have a conversation in your head of these three different drivers. And they all have different roles to play, and they all have different desires and urges and things that they do. Let's talk about how they come together. So you start to consider exercise. And it turns out that the motor is the primary driver, not all that surprising at this point, right? So the motor contemplates exercise, hmm. And it goes into the memory, and it says, okay, robot, what do we think of exercise? And the robot says, oh, you hate. <laughs> Crying, whining, maybe some bleeding, not something you like, right? So the motor says, ew, why would we do that? Thinker, why on earth would we exercise? And the thinker says, well, turns out we're fat. <laughs> and we have this high school reunion coming up, and let me give you an, a picture of what it's going to be like to walk into that high school reunion right now. And the motor says, ew, I don't want that. Thinker, here's the deal. Figure out a way that we can like going into that high school reunion without having to exercise now. And so the thinking part of your brain goes to work and says, well, you know, it's 5, 6 o'clock at night. It's dark out. You know, there's a lot of traffic on the roads. It wouldn't be safe to go out and run in that kind of situation. It's a health consideration. What we need to do is get up tomorrow an hour before work and then exercise then. It'll be quiet, right? We can get a great start on our day. It'll feel wonderful. The owner says, that's a great plan. What's on TV? <laughs> Next morning, the alarm goes off an hour early. The motor goes, oh, heck no. Thinker, get to work. Thinker says, well, we could exercise at lunch, <laughs> right? <laughs> Anybody able to relate to this dialogue in your head, right? We do this around spending money, around eating. Uh, around scheduling, we do it around work relations. Every part of our life, we have this constant rolling dialogue, conversation going on. And for the most part, we're unaware and unconscious of it. So let's become conscious of it and learn the three players involved. First, we have the robot. Let's do some visual aid. I do my own graphics. <laughs> Here's the robot. That's not very robot -y, so let's make it look more robot -y. We'll give him a square head and some little arms so we can do the robot dance. Right? So there's our friend, the robot. What the robot is is an information filter. I'll give an example of this in a minute. It also assigns meaning to events. Nothing means anything until we decide what it means. And it also stores our memories, beliefs, values. are all programmed and stored in a robot. Also perform learned behavior, brushing your teeth, things like that. You don't have to think about the robots in charge. Let's talk about the emoter, it's a visual aid for the emoter. Uh, or we're going to have a happy emoter today, and our emoter is going to have a bad hair day. <laughs> so here's the emoter. Uh, the emoter's got a couple things it does. It's really concerned only with the present. So when we're in an emotional state, we're not thinking future. We're just thinking what will make me feel better right now. The emoter also sees only what the robot and thinker show it. That's crucially important to understand. Let's do a visual aid to represent it. Here's what most people think happens. We see the world sight, sound, taste, touch, smell through our senses, and we think that we take those senses in and then emotionally respond to them. And that's not, in reality, what we do. What we do in reality is our senses go through our robot. And then the robot interprets filters, assigns meaning to, and then puts them up on a screen for the emoter to see. 
So our emotional response is not based on the events around us. Our emotional response is based on our unconscious robotic programming of events around us. Let's do an example. Let's say every time my whole life I ran across somebody wearing a green t-shirt, they came up, punched me in the nose. I'm not saying that has happened, but hypothetically speaking, if that had happened, and someone walks in right now wearing a green t-shirt, what would I do? Run, save yourselves, right? Because my robot would see that person and put an image up on the screen, you're gonna get punched in the face. And my, I would have an emotional response to that. You would see me have that response, look at the same person, your robot would put a different image on the screen, and you'd be confused, what's the matter with Jeff? <laughs> That's just Bob, he's a good guy. <laughs> and to me, I would look at you and think, you're crazy, why aren't you running? Can't you see the green t-shirt? Right? And so what happens is we each have a very different emotional experience of life, those emotions drive us stronger than anything, and most people are almost entirely unaware of where their emotions come from, let alone what to do about them. We've got to learn how to master this screen. Let's uh, finish out the story here. A couple other things the motor does. The more unhappy it is, the more it will drive. So when we're feeling good, we don't mind waiting, right? Uh, I hear a lot of the problem with Americans is instant gratification, right? Which would presume the answer is delayed gratification, to which I always think, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> I don't think anybody's good at delaying gratification. I think what happens is there are some people who are gratified now, so they're willing to wait for a different gratification later. But if I don't feel good right now, I'm gonna grab the food, I'm gonna spend the money, I'm gonna do whatever I need to do to feel better as quick as I can. So when the is unhappy, it's harder to manage. Right? The happier we feel, the easier it is to wait. Also, how it feels shapes what it sees. The emoter will ignore contradictory evidence and fabricate supporting evidence. For example, let's say you work with someone that doesn't like you. Hypothetically speaking, I'm sure it's not possible. But if they didn't like you and then you do a great job at something, what are they gonna do? In their head, they're gonna have a conversation. And they're gonna make up excuses. They're gonna ignore that great thing you didn't say. Oh, they just got lucky. You know, probably took credit for someone else's work. And you do something else great, and they're gonna say, oh, any moron could have done that. Or they'll start fabricating evidence. They're probably embezzling, <laughs> right? Because if we feel something emotionally, we tend to want to prove it. We're just coming out of election season now, and trust me, the people who run elections know how to pull your emotional chains. That's what they do, because people are driven by emotions. Let's finish the story out. We'll do a couple more examples here. Uh, we have the thinker. Let's do some visual aid for the thinker. Uh, we're gonna go with the intellectual stereotype of glasses making you smarter and a pocket protector. <laughs> and we'll wipe that smile off his face because the thinker doesn't feel. The thinker's just raw logic. And the thinker is not just about the future. The thinker also can see past and present and reinterpret it. You get a different interpretation, change what it means, what it thinks of past events of our memory and change how we're looking at things right now. And therein lies really the power and control of our lives. Thinker's got a couple things it does. It can see past, present, and future. It has a number of jobs. It needs to know where you are going. It needs to compare the reality to the emoter's response. So we have the ability in our brains to watch what we're doing and then question it. So if we're freaking out because a green t-shirt person, the thinker can say, well, maybe this green t-shirt's different than the other ones, and that rational part of our brain can question our emotions. The thinker can also manage the emoter, and that's one of the ways it does that. Notice the word manage, not control. The reason so many people are unsuccessful at changing the results in their life is they try and control their emotions. They try and use willpower to force ourselves, and I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna save, I'm gonna spend, I'm gonna exercise. Now, willpower doesn't last. We'll do an example of that. So let's, uh, let's play this out here. Uh, of how we might actually begin to manage that emotor and how we might actually begin to change some things. A friend of mine's driving along, and someone comes along, cuts him off in traffic. He has, his emotor sees this, puts an image up on the screen. His emotor, his, his robot translates this as big jerk. His robot actually translated a little different than that, but if you will, right? <laughs> his wife, so he's driving along, oh, you big jerk, right? His wife says, I'll bet they're rushing off to the hospital to be with their sick child. My friend says, oh, now that guy's just a big jerk, that's all that is. His wife says, what makes your fantasy any more real than mine? Because what she was able to do is have her thinker step in and change the screen. Because the thinker can take charge of the screen as well. You can consciously choose a different perception, a different interpretation. You can choose to perceive a different reality. And when you do, you feel different. And instead of having to go against our emotions, we can go with our emotions. 
Right? Most people try and fight against the tide of what they feel and what they want, what they desire, what they fear. Instead, what we need to do is change the programming, change the underlying uh, sponsoring beliefs and interpretations that are causing those emotions in the first place. Let's take a look, quick look at, at how you uh, actually change the robot. Because if we can change the robot's interpretations of things, perceptions of things, we'll feel different. If you felt differently about exercise, you might love to do it. And it would take no willpower whatsoever. If you felt different about the food you were eating, you would change the way you eat with no willpower whatsoever. So how does it take to change, what does it take to change that robot? The first two you probably knew. If you want to change a habit, change a behavior, you need to come up with a new behavior you're going to do. Talk to mentors, get some education. There's a lot of great behavior plans out there. The problem is most uh, advice books you read, all they give you is behavior advice. They say, do this behavior, you'll be successful. They don't tell you what it's going to take to do that behavior. But we need to do a new behavior. We need to do it for a period of time. How long does it take? 21 days, 30 days, you've heard that. That's a myth. It takes the brain longer to change that. Sometimes it doesn't take that long at all. Right? So it just depends on how deeply ingrained that behavior is for you to make a change in it. What you really need is this third ingredient that most people lack. And to illustrate this, uh, we're going to go back in time to a movie called War Games, Matthew Broderick, if you remember that. Those of you that are too young, uh, to heck with you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they had this scene at the beginning of War Games. They got two guys down in this missile silo, this bunker. And their job was to wait for the alarms to go off and then turn the key and fire their missile. So they're down there, and the alarms start going off, and the calls come in, fire your missile. So they're going through all their check codes and everything, and they get ready, and there's two different guys with two different keys, and they can't turn both keys at once. You need two people to launch a missile. That way, one person can't just freak out, have a bad day, and launch his missile. So they're getting ready to launch the missile, and they both have their keys in there, and they say, three, two, one, turn. One guy turns his key, the other guy doesn't. And the guy says, turn your key. He pulls his gun out, turn your key, sir, fire, turn your key. We've got to launch our missile. I'm not doing it, I can't do it, I can't do it. It was a very exciting scene. And then, you know, it wound down, it was just a drill, and clearly that guy got fired. <laughs> but what it shows is a wonderful illustration of why so many people are unsuccessful at creating change in their life. Because in our brains, we have the thinker and the emoter, and both of them have to turn their key for the robot to change. It goes like this. Your thinker decides, we're going to exercise, sneaks up on the emoter, clubs it over the head, throws it in a bag, stuffs it in the trunk, and starts driving to the gym. Right? Along the way to the gym, the thinker says, robot, remember this. We're exercising every day for the rest of our lives. Get used to it. It's going to be programming now. And the robot says, uh-huh. Hey, emoter, what do you think? And the emoter's in drunk. Oh, we're not doing this. Get me out of here. We're going home. <laughs> so as long as your thinker and emoter are in conflict, your brain will not take it as programming. It won't store it as memory. It won't overwrite existing programming and memory and, and things to do. It isn't until both the thinker and the emoter turn the key that your robot's going to change. And once your robot changes, creating the change you're looking for, creating the behaviors you desire become something you want to do instead of something you feel like you have to do. Thanks. That's my time.